This is your first visit to India as Prime Minister. In fact, this would have been, India would have been your first destination, except that you, you broke your duck by going to England before. What is the specific theme that you are carrying with you? Are you going to discuss um, business relations, promotion of business and trade, the, uh, the Indian Ocean Rim, or a whole variety of such issues? The first thing is to reaffirm our special, very special relationship we have with India. And uh, as you know, being invited for the independence celebration is a unique uh, invitation. It shows itself, and I'm very grateful to the Prime Minister that uh, he's uh, invited me for independence celebrations. And uh, this in itself is, again, a reaffirmation of the close link that we have to India, which we, I want to continue with, not only continue, but strengthen as much as we can. And uh, so this is the main thing. But don't forget also we're cooperating a lot on the economic uh, front. Both India and Mauritius have made giant strides in the economy with our offshore sector. The billions of dollars are being invested through the offshore sector. And uh, I know when I went to India last time, people were surprised that it was so. And also the natural links that we are, all these helps, of course. But also not just uh, this personal friendship, uh, that we are this personal attraction that uh, we have for India. We want to strengthen that link, but also for trade, as you rightly pointed out, and economic cooperation, and also to help us. India has been helping us uh, for a long time, you know, with all our training you know, in all sorts of fields, and we want to continue with that. What has India meant to you, Prime Minister? Just a piece of nostalgia, a, a place where your parents and your grandparents came from, there has been, yes, I must say, and you know, I was saying that, in fact, the other day again to the, to the High Commissioner. I've been to India twice before. One was to take the ashes of my father, to the, my mother to the Ganges, and then my father. And the third time I went when I was leader of the opposition. But every time we've been to India, myself and my wife and my family, we feel attracted to India. There must be this uh, fundamental attraction as if you're going back to your roots, in a way. And the more we, we go to India, the more we tend to want to come back to India. Have Indian leaders or Indian writers and thinkers conditioned your sort of intellectual makeup? Very many. You know, uh, first start, you know, my father was a secretary to the All India Congress when he was in London as a student. He, in fact, uh, knew then, when he was a student, uh, Gandhiji, Nehru, uh, Patel, Subhasana Bose. In fact, one day Subhash Chandra Bose asked him to, you know the book that Subhash Chandra Bose uh, wrote, The Indian Struggle? The, they asked him to go, uh, Subhash Chandra Bose asked him to, full, to read proof it for him, and which he did. And then he went, he was sent to a conference in Vienna in 1935 to, to help uh, Subhash Chandra Bose, and then Subhash Chandra Bose turned around and gave him a copy of the book with a long dedication in it, really long dedication which we have kept. 1935, the writing is still very clear. In fact, somebody was telling me, if you go to India next time, you should uh, bring it specially to uh, in this uh, Bengal region. You'll, you'll be welcome everywhere. Yeah. And the Nehru family, of course, we, uh, we, we knew. Well, my father knew uh, both Pandit Nehru, he, then Mrs. Indra Gandhi, uh, Sanjay Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi. All the people we knew very well. You mentioned the dynasty. You, you talked about Nehru, Indira Gandhi, and Rajiv Gandhi. Now, here you talked about an Indian dynasty. In fact, this region seems to be riven with dynasties. In Pakistan, you have Zede Bhutto's daughter, Benazir Bhutto. In Bangladesh, you have the founder of the nation, um, um, Mujibur Rahman's daughter, who is the prime minister now. In Sri Lanka, you've got Chandrika Kumaratunga, who is, I mean, there have been a series of Bandra Naikis. And now we have the dynastic principle here. Is there something about this region? Why does it happen? Why does it happen? Think about it. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but you know, recently in America, they are coming up with a theory that, that genes, they do transmit some things that people didn't realize. I think, I like, for myself, I try to stay away from politics altogether. I tried very hard to stay away from politics. But I got involved when I felt there was something that was unacceptable was happening and that somebody should stand up and say it loud and clear, alone. And when I stood up 
at that time. I was also against my own party at the time. But I thought people should, should somebody should stand up and say he didn't agree with this. And I think this is a bit in the blood in a way. You know, I remember very well, we're talking about uh, the Nehru family, I remember very well my father was on an official visit in London. Mr. Rajiv Gandhi was at the time a pilot. And we were at the hotel, and he found out my father was in London. He happened to have been flown in London. And he rang the hotel and asked whether he could see my father. And my father invited him for breakfast. And I remember because we were all there, myself, my wife, my brother-in-law, some officials from the High Commission, the High Commissioner, my mother, my sister were there. And uh, so we had breakfast. And I remember my father asking at one point, uh, he hears that he's not at all interested in politics. And he was saying that he says the same thing to me, to, to stay away if possible. And he said, I remember his, his words, and they were genuine words. He said, Prime Minister, I wouldn't touch politics with a barge pole. I'm very happy as a pilot. And, uh, and I'm sure he meant it. But eventually he was, uh, yeah, he felt he had to go in. The situations arise, I suppose. Prime Minister, we have uh, entered coalition politics in Delhi in a big way. In fact, Prime Minister, you will meet, uh, heads a coalition government. Now, you have had experience with coalition government since 1968 at least. How do you see the future of coalitions in, in, in a democratic structure? Yeah, in fact, even before 1968, we've had a coalition in 1963. After the general election of 1963, we didn't have a complete uh, majority. And we've had to go into a coalition then. And then since then, there has really been a, a coalition all the time. Uh, I think in a way it's a good thing, you know, what is important, we're a small island. What we need is to get, and of course being a small island, we have, uh, we must get the best people together in government. One of the things you mentioned earlier about uh, corruption, I've been saying something, you know, we, we have to get the best talent available for Mauritius, and we must be able to attract those talents into politics. This is one of the main things that uh, I've said over and over again. Some people have uh, criticized me for it. But, you know, we have to face those home truths. If you're not going to track the best people, then how are you going to have the best people? Are you thinking on, on, on the lines of the Singapore model? Because this is what Lee Kuan Yew used to say also. Yeah, Lee Kuan Yew is quite right. And uh, I said one point, Mrs. Mrs. Satcher used to say the same, same thing in the, in the United Kingdom. Uh, if uh, you're going to pay peanuts, while the same people, the good people, are going to get uh, paid proper pay outside. They will be going outside, they won't come. Well, why should they come into and help? Uh, but Singapore has a different system. Lee Kuan Yew would not um, vouch for being a liberal uh, Democrat, which mm -hmm. I dare say you, you probably, uh, which you are. Yes, I don't think the two exclude, uh, exclude each other. Uh, I remember when I was in the UK, this is why I mentioned uh, Baroness Thatcher. When she was Prime Minister, I saw her on television one day, defending the pay that he was paying some advisors. And he stressed, she stressed the point many times that we have to accept, unless we want, if we want to have the best time, we have to pay them properly. It's as simple as that. I think the two can mix. One doesn't exclude the other. Uh, pardon, I mean, I'm, I'm a little ignorant about the composition of your government here. What, what is the uh, number of technocrats in your government? Technocrats, uh, or are you? Are they just popular leaders? No, no, no. The no. level of education, level level of uh, intellectual, uh, uh, very high, very high. Uh, lots of technocrats. Uh, I mean, uh, if, if if you talk of technocrats, mean the broad sense of being well professionals and all well educated, because I saw you say that, and it's very high in the government. In the government, yes. Tell me, why, why has there been a coalition governments in your country when 70% of the people are of Indian origin? It should have been a straight outright victory. To me, on the face of it, it would seem like an outright winner. And, and you can rule till doomsday. <laughs> I wish that was, uh, that was the case. No, here, you know, uh, and this, this again, is, this is why I, make a, I made an appeal 
And in fact, the last election, as you know, was run on a, on a, on a communal basis. The issue was communal. And uh, had that been true, the previous Prime Minister would have won hands down. But uh, this is one of my appeal to the people of Mauritius, that we must start thinking in terms of uh, motions and national unity. Every time there's an election comes up, people tend to, politicians, tend to divide people into different uh, subdivisions, you know, in different, uh, oh, you're from this origin, that origin, and this caste or that caste, and then this is where the division comes in. I mean, caste? Is there a lot of caste uh, breakdown in, in Mauritius also? Uh, it appears, I don't know whether there's as many as in India, but uh, it appears every time an election comes up, I find new caste emerging. <laughs> Where in India are you from? Have you been able to um, uh, discover your roots? I believe my father and mother, when they went to India, they tried to do that. I think I should do the same. It's, it's not very clear to me, exactly. Were they able to locate their village? Uh, I'm not sure whether they were able to or not, but I know they were trying to find out. You know, it's very interesting that people in India are so attached to their villages. Indians forget everything except their villages, and yet I find that most of the people here have no idea of, of the villages they came from. Why do you think is that so? I have no idea. Why should they forget their villages? Unless, you know, from generations to generations, we haven't uh, paid notice to it. It fascinates me. That, uh, what language do you speak at home, Mr. Prime Minister? At home, uh, it varies. English, depending, uh, Creole. Uh, if you ask, uh, some people speak Bhojpuri in the villages, not, and Creole, you know, the two languages really spoken. The reason I'm asking this question is because 70% of the population here are of Indian origin. And yet I find that Creole and French are the preferred languages. How do you explain this? I think if you look at it in a historical point of view, they came here as indentured laborers. They were being... Uh, uh, they had uh, bosses who were speaking French, and then they had the previous uh, uh, slaves in Mauritius. I suppose they had to adapt, you know, what they say when you know them, do, do as the Romans do. I think that could explain it. Because there's another fascinating thing about your country, Prime Minister, that the British ruled here for 150 years, and yet they almost retained and nurtured French institutions, French names, language, culture, way of life, without any interruption. How do you explain that? Have you ever thought about it? Yeah, but don't, uh, if you for, don't forget that the, a lot of people of French origin were here, and uh, because it was a French colony before it became a British colony. And there were not very many British people who settled in Mauritius, but mainly, mainly French at the beginning. So I suppose that could have been, uh, can be an explanation. I suppose it's a question of, uh, if you have to run the country, you have to have the sympathies of the people who are in the country. Yeah, it's very interesting because the British colonized you, the British brought you from India to Mauritius, but you speak French, and, and more, more people speak French than English. Yeah, that's because of the origin of the history. It was a French colony before. Right. The Indian diaspora is spread far and wide, Mr. Prime Minister. Is there something uniquely Mauritian about the Indian diaspora in this part of the world? It's, uh, it's very mixed, you know, from since a long time you've had this, uh, it's a unique place, Mauritius, in the sense that you have all these communities, communities living next to each other. For example, I'll give you one example. The typical Indian food that we eat at home is different, I find, from the food that I eat from India. The flavor is slightly different. There is a slight variation to it. And, uh, and then there has been this uh, mixture of uh, different communities. And this has created something uh, where we are unique in a lot of ways. Well, in some ways, for instance, like in Fiji, there, is, there has been an opposition of the Melanesian, native Melanesians. In Trinidad and Tobago, half the population is, is black Africans. Uh, you are fighting among yourselves. There's nothing else to fight against. Well, uh, you know the, the, the saying, and I keep, in fact, I was there uh, yes, about the other day, I said it. Just stand back and think, if we look and see that if we say 70%, and yet the elections don't produce those results, it gives you food for thought. This is why I say 
in whose interest is it for division to take place, and that we must stay united. As a country, we have to stay united. Political power in this country has been in the hands of people of Indian origin. And yet, the 2% people of French origin, white, French, control 90% of the strategic areas of your economy. How and why? And why has that not been corrected by any of the prime ministers and even by you? I've just become prime minister of the last uh, six months. I had a long time to go. No, but the thing is, you know, we, we must look at it again in a historical perspective. Uh, we've seen what happened in other countries where governments have come in and tried to be very radical and depossess uh, depossess people of their of their homes of the land and all this and it's a, it's a recipe for for disaster Mauritius on the other hand hasn't when we won independence for example there was a campaign which was being said that people from Indian origin would uh, take away your land they will take away all the industries they will impose this they will impose that uh, my father who was the first uh, prime minister of uh, brought independence to this country. Didn't do that. He fought. We have a unique chance to make Mauritius a successful economy and a successful country where we, everybody will feel at peace to live and work. And we want to encourage uh, entrepreneurs. And you know, we must accept the fact that there are new entrepreneurs emerging in Mauritius. They are? They are. Indian? Indian as well. I thought Indians are mostly in small businesses and them. No, some of them. percent of major strategic industries in French hands. Well, when you say French, I mean, uh, the no, Mauritians, no, no. don't forget. No, no. They're, they're, they're Mauritians of originally French origin, but they are Mauritians. Right. But uh, a lot of other people are coming up. Tell me, when you entered politics, what kind of vision do you have for Mauritius? Like, what is the Mauritius of your, your utopian concept of Mauritius, say, in 2010? Oh, I think Mauritius is going to be a very strong country in the Indian Ocean. We're going to be a center in the Indian Ocean. Uh, you know, through our relations with different countries in the region, I think we can be a regional, important regional uh, power, if I may say so. I think we have the talent, we have the ability, we have the contacts, although we don't have any natural resources, but our human resources are the greatest asset we have. But we need to be able to pull together and try to work together in that direction. Our contacts, you know, now that we've joined different, uh, recently we've joined SADC, for example, we are going to play and we want to play very, a, a, a more, we are very keen to play a, a forward role as if in, in SADC. I mentioned that to President Masiri the other day when I met him. But Mauritius is very keen, although we are a new member of SADC. We and this is South, a South African Development yeah, Corporation. That's right. And, uh, and our contact, it's, it is through our contacts, you know, the special relationship we have with India. The Indian Ocean Rim idea is an idea which originated in Mauritius. And this is why we are very keen to have to, to continue to play a central role in that, in that organization. So I think we have all the potential to become a great nation. Talking of the Indian Ocean Rim, what exactly is the project? Is it going to be 7 or 14? I believe the membership is being increased. We, we are about to, you know, we've already invited the other 7. And uh, this is uh, uh, reality. We have invited them. They have agreed. And at the next meeting, we're going to have a membership of 14. And the draft resolutions are being uh, uh, looked into. And uh, there was a question of how how are you going to expand uh, eventually? So we have to look at that. But at the moment, seven have become 14. We're planning to increase the membership further. Because the Australians have had a different approach altogether. At the way I met Gareth Evans in Australia when he was the foreign minister. And he, his concept at that stage was, let it be a free forum for everybody. The waters of the Indian Ocean, all the countries that are awash with the Indian Ocean should join in. Yeah, different people have uh, different opinions. If you have, uh, I believe if you have an organization which is going to be very big, it's going to be very difficult uh, to handle. And I think we have to know how to gradually increase the membership. What exactly is the concept? What, what Indian Ocean Rim as what? As some kind of an economic grouping like ASEAN? A bit, in the end? Yeah, yes, that's mainly economic. 
we are, we are, we are speaking of. A bit like Asian and the Pacific Ocean Rim, we've seen the, the different countries. Now, the South Africans have been talking about a, an Indian Ocean region as opposed to an Indian Ocean Rim. Does one concept contradict the other? I think uh, one doesn't exclude, doesn't exclude the other because Indian Ocean region, uh, South Africa, as you know, is a member of SADC. Uh, in this, uh, the engine, in fact, of that region, is the, of, of the Indian Ocean uh, region. So, Indian Ocean Rim, I suppose, the main countries in the Indian Ocean region. Now, this business, you've just been to England. You obviously must have discussed the question of Diego Garcia. Is this just a polite um, issue that you raise with the Brits politely every now and again, or is it a serious commitment? And at what stage? are you in, in recovering those islands? Is there a commitment on your part? Of course there is a commi there's a commitment. What is the, 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 the commitment is, you know, the, what the agreement was, that uh, Jebel Garcia is going to be returned to Mauritius once there is no use for Jebel Garcia. But then, unfortunately, as you know, there was the I Iraqi uh, war, and Jebel Garcia was used as a very important base at the time. So that put us back. Uh, a little bit, but we want to have a stable uh, stability in the region, and so we can see the use that he was put to. But uh, with modern uh, warfare, with modern equipment, modern communication, probably less and less, Russia will become less and less important. So we want to, at some stage, to be able to have back Russia. Why can't you get it back and then you lease it to the Americans and make money on it? Yeah, but you, you know the history of uh, Jaku Gacha, how Jaku Gacha was not part of Mauritius when we became independent. Yeah, I mean, you, the, it was ceded away. It, it before, before independence. Right. We were still a British colony then. Right. right. You, at this point in time, are talking about the economy of Mauritius and how Indians are contributing to it. I find Indian textile businesses are coming here. Factories are opening up. Are there any other sectors that you are going to discuss in India? And what more can you do to attract similar uh, ventures in this country? I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to speak to the Indian uh, business community, uh, both in Delhi and I think in Bombay as well. Bombay, I think, will be more in official because it won't, will be on my way back. And in fact, I want to tell them about the advantages of investing in Mauritius. The, advan the big advantage in Mauritius is that the access to markets that you can have through Mauritius. Because we have, uh, could you specific? Well, we have, we have a special relationship with the European Union. Uh, with America, we have a quota system, but we 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 are we still have possibilities of expanding there. So I think all these, uh, and now that we are a member of SADC, it's another advantage to to invest in Mauritius. In what way is Mauritius going to help us? Because we are at a stage in our life when our economy is opened up, uh, liberalisation is at a very advanced stage, in fact, what can Mauritius do to enable us to attract investments? But this, this is, uh, this is uh, being looked at as well. I can tell you, you'll be surprised, there is, for the first time, there is a uh, Mauritian businessman who has opened a factory, 100% Mauritian, in Bangalore. And he's been telling me, I met him, in fact, in the, the other Prime day. Minister's state. Yes. <laughs> so, in the Prime Minister's state. Yeah. Well, Thank you very much. Very kind of you, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you very much indeed for the time you've given us. You're welcome.